It is good to be with you again tonight. I hope all of you are doing well. Uh, please remember as we get started tonight, this would be a great time to sign up for Sunday worship at nine o'clock. If you're able to join us in person this coming Sunday at nine, we would love to see you then. And be sure to sign up on the Sign Up Genius account. Let me know if you have any trouble with that or get in touch with Kenna. She'd be glad to help you through that process as well. Thank you so much for your help with this. We had several visitors this past Sunday and it was so good to be able to uh, make sure that we had enough room for them. Knowing who was coming in advance really helps. And so thank you so much for doing that. Tonight we continue with our brand new study of the book of Acts. Acts is the book of gospel action. As we learned last week, the Acts of the Apostles, or more accurately, some of the Acts of some of the Apostles, since the book focuses primarily only on Peter and Paul. Uh, Acts, like Luke, is addressed to a man by the name of Theophilus. It seems that both books were written by Luke, the beloved physician, as he is referred to later in the Bible by the Apostle Paul. The book of Luke is often considered to be volume one, the life of Jesus, and the book of Acts is considered to be volume two, the growth of the early church. Two weeks ago, I invited all of you to read through the entire book of Acts in one sitting, if at all possible, or you could watch somebody else read it or listen to somebody read it online or on a CD or an MP3 of some kind. Uh, last Thursday, just uh, just under a week ago, I drove over to Brookfield to get my first dose of the Pfizer vaccine. And on the way over there, I fired up the CD player in the car with a CD of the Bible that had been in there for quite a long time. And I skipped over to the book of Acts and listened to Acts between Madison and Brookfield. I made it to Acts 17. By the time I got over there to Brookfield and finished the entire book of Acts, by the time I make it, made it maybe back to Lake Mills or so. I don't know exactly how long that took, but very roughly just over two hours to listen to the entire book of Acts all at once, except for the brief pause to get a shot in the arm over there. And it was very interesting to uh, hear the entire book of Acts all at once. I wish I could have taken notes as I was driving. A number of things came to mind, some things that I had not noticed before. Uh, connections between passages, background information that became more relevant, other passages that tied into what was happening. But I hope to do it again sometime, maybe when I go back for the second shot in a couple weeks. But I would highly recommend listening or reading the entire book of Acts all at one time, if at all possible. There is a tremendous value to getting the big picture like that. Last week, we looked at the first eight verses of Acts chapter 1, and we found something of a transition with some overlap between the gospel accounts and what we find here in the book of Acts. We looked at Jesus presenting himself alive to the disciples. Uh, we looked at his command to stay in Jerusalem and to wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we looked at Jesus' promise or commission that the disciples would be his witnesses, starting in Jerusalem, then in Judea, then into Samaria, and ultimately to the remotest parts of the earth. And this is where we had the beautiful illustration with the circles inside of circles, illustrating the growth of the church, almost like ripples when you throw a rock into a pond. And Acts 1 verse 8, where this is found, is basically an outline of the whole book. The church would start in Jerusalem, it would move into Judea, it would then go to Samaria, and then it would spread pretty much everywhere. And this is what we actually see happening throughout the book of Acts. Before we pick up with Acts 1 verse 9 tonight, I want to just briefly review why Acts is so important. And we considered this briefly last week. But as I was watching class myself last week, last Wednesday evening, I regretted not putting this in bullet form. I kind of had it in uh, paragraph form, just kind of summarizing the significance or the benefits, why we have the book of Acts, why this book is so important. But these are some of the benefits. Just outlined very briefly in bullet form some of the benefits of studying the book of Acts. It is a study of church history. And certainly as a new convert or outsider, Theophilus needed to know these things. And so Luke was bringing him up to speed. Who are these people? This is how the church grew. Uh, secondly, the book of Acts explains God's plan of salvation. And not only outlines the plan in a number of sermons and personal encounters by the apostles, but it also gives examples of people following God's plan. This is what you do, and this is how you do it. Uh, thirdly, the book of Acts gives us a deeper appreciation for Peter and Paul as later authors of New Testament books. Without Acts, the rest of the New Testament really wouldn't make as much sense as it does. And I asked us to imagine going straight from the gospel accounts right over into Romans. 
Without the book of Acts, we would have no idea who this Paul guy is. And so Acts shows some huge changes with Peter, and it also uh, gives us an explanation of who Paul actually is. Peter goes from an immature, outspoken a, a disciple to a pillar of the church, and of course Paul comes on the scene and is baptized and does a number of missionary journeys. Uh, the book of Acts also explains the geographical growth of the church from Jerusalem to Rome. This is how the church gets all the way to Rome, even though it was seen uh, merely as a sect of the Jews at the very beginning. In fact, uh, Wayne Jackson's commentary has a subtitle of something about the book of Acts and then from Jerusalem to Rome. That's the theme of the book of Acts. It shows the growth of the church uh, geographically. The book of Acts also explains the political innocence of the Lord's Church. These people are not political revolutionaries. Uh, we discussed Theophilus perhaps being a Roman official of some kind, since Luke describes him as most excellent Theophilus. Uh, these people are not out to overthrow the Roman government. Caesar has nothing to fear from you know, being taken off his throne by the uh, Christian movement, even though the leader of Christianity was unjustly executed by the empire. Christians were not about political revolution. Uh, we see a number of church problems resolved in this book. That's the next bullet point down there. As we have often said, the church is a perfect organization made up of imperfect people like us. And the book of Acts gives us a pattern concerning how to deal with this. How do we deal with the imperfections of Christians? And then finally, Acts helps us to verify the historical accuracy of the Bible. This is not a fairy tale. And so Luke mentions 32 countries, 54 cities, 9 Mediterranean islands. Also, he alludes to 95 different people, um, uh, 62 of which are not mentioned anywhere else in the New Testament. 27 of these are unbelievers, chiefly civil or military officials. That was a quote last week that we looked at from one of the sources. And many of these names and places can be verified in secular history. And so this is not a once upon a time and a land far, far away kind of book. This is actual history. And Luke nails that down for us in the book of Acts by mentioning these real people and places that can be verified. Well, with this by way of review, let us continue tonight with Acts chapter 1, verse number 9. So Acts 1, verse 9 is where we pick up tonight. As most of you can see, uh, I have included the blanks for the ABCs of Acts over on the right-hand side of the screen. As we study, I would invite you to be thinking ahead of time about a word that summarizes what happens in the chapter that we're studying corresponding to the appropriate letter of the alphabet. I have what I learned from my dad uh, back when he taught the teen class in Crystal Lake when I was a kid. Um, but you might have something better, and that's the value of studying together as a group. I wish we could be in person for this, because I know some of you have some great ideas on these. I have some of these written down in my notes from uh, studying this individually with people over the past 20 or 30 years. But if you think of something better than I've thought of or that my dad had from wherever he got it back in the 80s or 70s, uh, I want you to get in touch. Let me know if you have a good one. Give me a call, send a message, send an email, put it in the comments on YouTube or Facebook, and I would be glad to add it as we move forward. Some of these are not perfect by any means. Uh, they help me remember what's in each chapter, even to this day when I think of... You know, chapter 20, that's, well, that's the letter T. That's Troas on the Lord's Day. Well, you can go ahead and fill that one in, I guess, if you want to. We'll be be there in a few months, I suppose. Uh, but that's the value of getting the letters, uh, the ABCs of Acts, in this way. It helps us remember what's in each book. And we'll use this by way of review. Uh, a few years ago, Kenna sent me the words to Acts Rap. Uh, some lyrics to help us remember what's in each chapter. But if you have not figured it out by now, I am not a rapper. And so I will I will spare you the horror of me rapping through the book of Acts. Uh, we do, though, have the ABCs. I am much more familiar, much more comfortable with the ABCs than I am with rap. And so I would love to hear your suggestions as we go through this book, if you have any improvements, which I'm sure that you will. But let's start tonight with Acts chapter 1 verses 9 through 11. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. 
And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. So what's going on here? This is the ascension, isn't it? Jesus is ascending back into heaven, and that is the first of the ABCs of Acts. A is for ascension. And again, I'll see how this goes, but for now, I'm thinking about leaving this over on the right-hand side of the screen there as we work our way through the whole book. Uh, hopefully, it'll serve as something of an ongoing review. We can work our way through the book, keeping this over in the right-hand margin there, and we'll be able to remember what's in each chapter as we go forward. But again, if you think, some, think of something better than Ascension for Acts chapter 1, please let me know. We'll have another one later in this chapter, even tonight, that might work. And maybe you have something else, but uh, let me know, get in touch if you do have something there. Uh, in verse 9, I would point out that Jesus was lifted up. Uh, he did not launch himself into heaven. And I don't know how significant that is, but he was passive in this process. Uh, later, this matches later what we find in 1 Timothy 3.16. Paul will go on to say that Jesus was taken up in glory. And so he didn't jump, that was not what's going on here, but he was received by a cloud. He was taken up. Uh, he was lifted up into heaven in the midst of this cloud. We also find here that the disciples were gazing intently. And as I understand it, the word Luke uses here apparently carries the idea of stretching or perhaps straining to see something. So we can see these men with their with their necks outstretched, they are straining with their heads tilted back, looking very intently into the sky. So they are gazing intently, watching the Lord as he is taken up into the sky. As he disappears, the disciples then see two men. Apparently, these are angels in human form. That's the way I would take this at least. And these messengers inform the disciples that Jesus would come back in the same way that they have watched him leave. And so we learn from that, that Jesus will return in the clouds. So he will come back just the same way that he left. And that indicates to us that his second coming or his return will be visible. It will not be a secret return, as some have suggested that it will be. But it would be visible. It would be public. Everybody could see it. His return will also be literal at some point in the future, not symbolic like when he's described as coming in judgment with the destruction of Jerusalem in Matthew 24, 30, but he will actually return in the clouds just as he left us. All right, let's move on then and let's continue with Acts 1, verses 12 through 14. Acts 1, 12 through 14. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they had entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were sitting. That is, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, the James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. These also, with one mind, were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. After the ascension, they head back from the Mount of Olives and into the city of, De of Jerusalem, just as Jesus had commanded, about a Sabbath day journey away, roughly uh, three quarters of a mile, according to tradition. That's as far as they were allowed to travel on the Sabbath day, the way they interpreted God's commandment. And when they come back into the city, Luke tells us that they go back to the upper room. And some have suggested that since we have the word the in the reference to the upper room, that this might suggest that this is the same room where they ate the Last Supper. So not just an upper room, not just an upper room somewhere, but they went back to the upper room. So whether or not it's the same room, we don't know. I'm just pointing out some of the commentaries uh, suggested that as a possibility. This was the place where they kind of used as their headquarters or where they came to assemble together as a small group. And then we have a list of the apostles and a note that some women are there as well, along with Mary, the Lord's mother, 
and along with his brothers. Uh, just a note on the women there, remember Luke uh, had a habit of mentioning women in his gospel account, and he specifically mentioned a number of women who were following along after Jesus uh, during the three and a half years of his earthly ministry. And so as I take this, as Theophilus reads this book, he's saying, ah, the women, they're still there. And so there is some continuity between volume one and volume two by specifically re uh, remembering the women here again. Uh, since this is the last reference to Mary in the New Testament, we should make just a quick note or two on Mary here. First of all, notice Mary is never described as some supernatural character. Uh, Mary is often perceived by many in the religious world as some kind of intercessor for us, or almost as some kind of co-redeemer with Jesus. But she's never described that way in Scripture. In fact, here the last time that she's mentioned, of all places, you would think this would be some way to really put a lot of respect on Mary that uh, a lot of people in the religious world seems to seem to have. But uh, there, there's nothing like that in this passage. She's mentioned as being there, but really nothing beyond that. I would also point out that Jesus' brothers are here. Well, what does that have to do with Mary? Well, many in the religious world also teach that Mary was a virgin perpetually. And this is clearly not the case if Jesus had younger brothers, right? We know how that works. And another thought on Mary, the fact that she is in Jerusalem and not back home up in Nazareth seems to confirm that John is most likely fulfilling his duty to take care of her, as Jesus had asked him to do on the cross. Woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother, and so on. And so as an apostle, John had to stay in Jerusalem, and because he was given the responsibility of caring for Mary. Mary is with him there as well. As to the brothers themselves, we should probably point out and note here that the last time we heard about Jesus' brothers, what were they doing? In Mark 3.21, Mark says that when his own people heard of what Jesus was doing, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying, he has lost his senses. And so Jesus' own people, his kinsmen, thought that he had lost his mind. And his own family said, this is messed up. Our brother thinks he's God. I'm kind of paraphrasing there. But if one of our siblings thinks he or she is God, we would get concerned about that, wouldn't we? We would try to take him away quietly and get him away from the crowds. And that seems to be what they did there or tried to do in Mark 3.21. And so Jesus' own people thought that he had lost his mind completely. But now his own brother seemed to be on board with the Christian faith. When your brother gets crucified, and when your brother comes back from the dead, that has a way of changing the family dynamic, doesn't it? The resurrection changes everything for Peter, for John, for the Lord's own physical half-brothers, we might say, and then also for us today. And that's something I don't want us to miss in this passage. I want to try to point out more uh, practical applications of this book, and I would point that out here. As we apply this book to our own life, think about the impact that the resurrection had on the Lord's own physical brothers. That should have the same impact on us. When we realize that Jesus really did come back from the dead, it has a way of changing us. It gives us confidence that we didn't have before. And so the Lord's own brothers seem to go from unbelievers to believers at this point. They are now interested in what's going on. All of these people, Luke says, all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer. If you're using the King James, this verse is how we know that the apostles drove Hondas. As the KJV has Luke saying that they all continued in one accord. I hope you will forgive me for that. The disciples in Acts 1 were in one accord. Or here, of course, they did everything together. They were of the same mind. Well, this brings us to the next passage, as they are still in the upper room, in one accord, with one mind. We now come to Acts 1, verses 15 through 20. Acts chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. At this time, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren. A gathering of about 120 persons was there together, and said, Brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was counted among us and received his share in this ministry. 
Now this man acquired a field with the price of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his intestines gushed out. And it became known to all who were living in Jerusalem, so that in their own language that field was called Hakeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his homestead be made desolate, and let no one dwell in it, and let another man take his office. Right away, we see Peter taking something of a leading role in this situation. This meeting takes place at some point in that 10-day period between Jesus' ascension and the day of Pentecost. And at some point in there, Peter stands up, he takes the lead, and what he says is based on Scripture, as he will eventually quote from Psalm 69 and also Psalm 109. As he works his way toward these Scriptures, he introduces his line of reasoning he attributes both passages to the Holy Spirit who spoke through David, which is interesting. But before he gets to the quotes from the Psalms, he summarizes what has just happened with Judas. And this matches up with what we know from the Gospel accounts, that Judas became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. This was Judas's role in the crucifixion. In verse 17, notice how Peter says that Judas was counted among us and received his share in this ministry. And this is important, because those who say that it is impossible to fall away, that once we're saved, we're always saved, some of them will say that Judas was never really a true follower in the first place. That's how they get around this. Um, Peter uh, is uh, clearly indicating that Judas was on the inside. So, so Judas was one of us. He's not saying that he never was an apostle, but he's saying, yes, he was. He was a true follower, and then he turned. So we can get that out of this passage. Then in verses 18 and 19, we have a section that the New American Standard puts in parentheses. I know we don't have parentheses in the original Greek language, of course, but it is a parenthetical statement, kind of giving us some background information about Judas and what he did. He acquired a field with the price of his wickedness. Not directly, of course. He didn't go out there and purchase the field. But as we know from the Gospel accounts, he tried to give the money back. The chief priest wouldn't take it. It was blood money, which is interesting. They gave him the blood money. They made the deal. Now they won't take the money back. No refunds on blood money, apparently. And so they used it instead to purchase a field that they would use for burying the poor, the potter's field, apparently somewhere where potters uh, used to dig for clay. It's in this context we find out that when Judas died, he fell headlong and he burst out open in the middle and all his intestines gushed out. Well, it seems kind of weird to me that Peter would explain this, right? This is a, this is gross. This is disgusting. And I mean, to find this in scripture is just a little bit unreal, but he goes on to explain in verse 19, everybody knew about it. And so this is common knowledge. Everybody's talking about this. And remember, this is just a few weeks ago in time sequence. So this is within the last few weeks. Everybody is talking about this situation. Everybody knows about Judas and his guts bursting out all over the place. In fact, it is so well known that the people renamed the field, and they now refer to it as the Field of Blood. So that, that's how that name came to be, which, of course, Theophilus could verify, and he could go back, and he could research that legend and find that it's based in actual truth. Um, by the way, did you notice how Luke leads up to the name of this field? He refers to the name of the field and what they called it in their own language. What does that tell us? It's a reminder that Luke is not a Jew. This is not Luke's language, but it is the language of the Jewish people. Luke was a Gentile, as his name suggests, and Theophilus was a Gentile as well. And so he's giving this word of explanation to Theophilus, a fellow Gentile. They called it this because this is what this word means in their own language. Not our language, but their language. This is in perhaps Hebrew or Aramaic. It's not in Greek or Latin. Uh, some have pointed out a possible contradiction here. Matthew tells us that Judas hanged himself. But Luke tells us here that he fell, hell, fell headlong and his guts flew out. So... Some have said, look, there's, there's a problem there. We've got two different methods of death going on. We need to realize, though, that both could very easily be true. Yes, Judas did hang himself, but it's also possible that he either, one, hung himself from a very high place and the rope broke and he fell, and 
everything cut loose. Or number two, he hung there so long that he fell and burst open because of some, you know, decomposition had, had happened over a few days or weeks. And there might be other ways of explaining that, but really it only takes one possible explanation. There, there really is no contradiction between Matthew and Acts. So we just need to be aware of this in terms of practical application because some uh, people who don't believe the Bible will turn to this and they'll try to point out a contradiction between the two accounts. In verse 20, Peter starts moving to the prophecy itself, and he uses these quotes from the Psalms to show that someone else needs to pick up where Judas left off. So we need to replace this apostle, not just because he died, but because he left in the way that he did. He was a betrayer, and so he needs to be replaced. So let's continue on then tonight with Acts 1, verses 21 through 28. Acts 1, 21, actually it looks through verse 26 here. Acts 1, 21 through 26. Therefore it is necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they put forward two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all men, show which one of these two you have chosen to occupy this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they drew lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. Because of the prophecies in Psalms, it is necessary to, to find a replacement. And notice Peter lays out the qualifications. In order to be considered for this position, the person, number one, first of all, must have been with us from the beginning, going all the way back to the days of John's baptism. So this couldn't have been a newcomer of any kind. This had to be somebody who had been with them from the beginning, from over the, over the past three and a half years. Secondly, this witness needs, or this person needs to have been a witness of the Lord's resurrection. He needs to have seen the Lord after he raised from the dead. And so with these as the two qualifications, notice they put two names before the group. Barsabbas, also called Justice, and Matthias. They pray and they ask God to make the final decision. They do that by drawing lots. The lot falls to Matthias and Matthias is the replacement for Judas. He is added to the eleven. And as far as I can tell, we never hear this man's name again. Uh, he appears here, and then he disappears. Uh, one of the early church fathers has suggested that Matthias was one of the 70 sent out by the Lord in Luke chapter 10, verse 1. So that was a, some kind of oral tradition back in the mid-2nd century or so. It would have been passed along through several generations that that was part of Matthias' background, that he had been one of the 70. We don't know that from Scripture. I'm just saying that that's out there in tradition. A later tradition suggests that Matthias becomes a missionary to Ethiopia. And again, that's not in the Bible. That's by way of secular, outside the Bible kind of writings from the church fathers. And like I said earlier, the, act, uh, the book of Acts reflects some of the acts of some of the apostles. And the other men in this list, this list of names that we've just read, we don't know. They went everywhere preaching the gospel to the remotest parts of the earth. And beyond that, uh, we really only focus on Peter and John and then ultimately Paul in the last two-thirds of the book. As we think about these qualifications to be numbered with the twelve, it pretty much guarantees that we don't have apostles today, right? As some religious groups claim that we do. There are some religious groups today that say the apostleship, the twelve, that we still have twelve with us today, that they've been constantly replaced, a constant string of twelve apostles going all the way back to the beginning. And yet... Nobody today has been with the Lord from the beginning since the baptism of John, and nobody today has been an eyewitness of the Lord's resurrection. And so it's impossible. Nobody today meets these qualifications. Um, in fact, I find it interesting that when the apostle James is murdered by Herod in Acts 12, 1 and 2, they don't pick a replacement then as they do for Judas, as far as we're told. By that time, fewer and fewer would have met the qualifications. There were fewer and fewer people who had been with Jesus from the beginning and who had been eyewitnesses of his resurrection. And then on top of that, the apostleship itself 
Yeah, almost to me seems like scaffolding around a building under construction, kind of to help the church get off the ground until they could get the word of God out there in written form. And that's certainly what the Lord uh, predicted on the night before he was crucified there in those middle chapters in John. The, the Holy Spirit would come and would communicate with the apostles. And then, of course, we know they went on to write down the messages. And that's what we have today. So we really have uh, no need of an ongoing apostleship. A few thoughts on this passage. Uh, Barsabbas um, was apparently a really good person. All right, this uh, choice number two, guy who comes in second place here. Uh, think about the fact that he was with them from the beginning. Here's a man going all the way back to the baptism of John. Barsabbas was a faithful disciple, but he was not chosen. Do you think his feelings might have been hurt a little bit? Well, that's quite a bit of a letdown, isn't it? I'm not saying he was or wasn't, but imagine to be so close to actually being one of the 12 apostles. And yet we have no indication that Barsabbas left in a huff. He didn't run out the door. Oh, I wasn't chosen to be an apostle. I'm out of here kind of thing. Nothing like that is indicated. I know we sometimes get disappointed that we aren't chosen for something or something doesn't go our way or we don't get this or that that we were planning on or somebody does something in the church we disagree with, not a doctrinal concern, but in the matter of opinion. Uh, but just imagine coming in second place in a, in a two-way contest to be the next apostle. One of the, uh, on the Monopoly, isn't one of the little cards second place in a beauty contest or something like that? But anyway, Barsabbas, I'm just saying, was a good person. He was qualified to be an apostle, but he was not the one to be chosen. And just want to think about that for a moment from his point of view. Uh, one other observation on this passage. Notice what else Peter says about Judas. He is so restrained here. This is not the way we would have put this, perhaps. Uh, Peter could have very easily ripped into Judas all throughout this meeting. That low-down, dirty, rotten person who betrayed the Lord, and you know, he could have just gone on and on. But notice, as it is, he refers to Judas having turned aside to go to his own place. Notice how calm that is. There's no railing judgment. There's no sense of shouting or, or anger. But Peter simply explains that Judas chose his own destination. Judas made some choices in his life. And think about the contrast between Judas and Peter. Both men denied or betrayed the Lord, in a sense, didn't they? There are a lot of similarities between Judas and and Peter. Their behavior is very similar. A betrayal and a denial. Both are absolutely horrific to betray or to deny the Son of God at the time of his death. But think about how these two men reacted. Judas had remorse, and he went his way. He did his thing. Peter, on the other hand, also had remorse, but how did he handle it? He came back to Jesus. The relationship between Jesus and Peter was restored, and certainly we're thankful that Peter made that decision instead of doing what Judas did, which he very easily could have done, having been overwhelmed by the grief that he was in. Uh, by the way, somebody has suggested another A for chapter 1, Apostle Appointed. Apostle Appointed. That certainly would be very accurate. We might run out of room if we put all of the possibilities actually on the on the screen here, but uh, but apostle appointed, I would say, would be a very good option here. So ascension or apostle appointed would certainly fit very well in chapter one. Again, if you have any other suggestions for A for chapter one, I would love to hear about that. And uh, this brings us to the end of chapter one. And so next week, let's pick up with Acts chapter two. And remember, be looking for a word that starts with the letter B to summarize what happens in Acts chapter two. Also, uh, try to either read through or listen to the entire book of Acts all at once, if at all possible. It will help us understand what's going on in the whole book. A class is uh, mostly what we put into it, and I, I learned that in college. You can just go through a class and skim the surface and make an A if you want to, or you can read the text and read the footnotes and uh, and get a lot more out of it and do extra reading and, and put some more work into it. And that would certainly enhance what we learned from this book. So uh, read ahead at a minimum, read chapter two and try to look for a B that would summarize that uh, that chapter. But uh, go ahead and read the whole book again if you want to. It's just a beautiful book and it certainly makes a lot more sense when we read it from cover to cover. 
Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to study together tonight. I hope to see all of you on Sunday at 9 a.m. Again, this would be a great time right now at the end of class to sign up while you have your phone or, or computer open. Uh, let me know if I can help and let me know if uh, you have something that we need to be praying about. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise you tonight as the one and only true God. As Peter prayed so long ago, we know tonight that you know the hearts of all people. You created us. You know what we need even before we think to ask. We ask that you bless our congregation here in Madison as we take steps for more of us to transition back to meeting in person. It's been so long, and so we ask for wisdom. We ask for courage. We want to do what is right and what is good. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. Tonight we've learned about your Son ascending into heaven, where he now serves as a faithful high priest. Because of this, we're able to come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.